Let's try this one more time. All right. We're here at Jazz Live San Diego with Matt Slocum. Matt, welcome back to Jazz Live San Diego. Thanks for having me, Vince. Tell us a little bit about the musicians you've got playing with you tonight. It's going to be Dave Robert on bass and my good friend, Mr. Josh Nelson, on the piano. Um, I used to live in California, and uh, this is like 10 years ago. I mean, it moved about five years ago, but 10 years ago I started playing with Josh, and we had a trio, and then we toured with his vocalist, Sarah Gazarek, for a while and kept playing some of Josh's music. And since I moved, we still get together every now and then and play. Excellent. Well, um, uh, before we talk about your uh, last release uh, from 2011, After the Storm, which we didn't get a chance to talk about last time, um, I was trolling around your website and I noticed that you've recently recorded some new quartet music. And there's actually a couple tracks out there for folks to listen to out in the listen section of your website. Uh, and you actually uh, sprung a, a new disc on us uh, here today, so... Um, advanced uh, copy. Advanced copy. We love that kind of thing. Um, tell us a little bit about this new music. Uh, does it reflect any particular change or an evolution in your music? Um, I would say that the... I don't want to even say new record because it's not even out yet. It's going to come right. out next year, but mm -hmm. um, the, this upcoming record uh, is... Compositionally, it's more more through composed. It's moving away from um, just having like melody, improvisation, melody formats, and I'm trying to explore some different things there. Um, an obvious change is after the storm was just a trio record, mm -hmm. and so here this is quartets: half Walter Smith on saxophone, half Dana Stevens. Um, and this is the first time I've really try to put together a project where it's, um, they're all, kind of, I wouldn't say it's like a suite, you know, where it's just, but all the tunes I picked and some come back in later spots on the record and it's tied together, um, so I would say there's a theme throughout it. That's excellent. So that's your third disc and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing that uh, in the new year and uh, playing that and hopefully we'll get you back on the station and we'll uh, do a little more in depth on that. Um, uh, when you were here last in 2010, your disc Portraits had just come out, and uh, um, in, in October of 2011, you released After the Storm, and you were just kind of mentioning that this was, uh, your new music is quartet music, and on Portraits, you also uh, were playing in some uh, quartets and even uh, quintet settings, I believe. Yeah, Portraits is like a smorgasbord. Right? Yeah, it was a whole lot of different stuff. Um, and uh, that, that difference between uh, that and then After the Storm, as you mentioned, was a trio uh, setting. Were you uh, trying to do something different on After the Storm than Portraits by uh, going with a trio? Yeah, I, I feel like with a lot of musicians, myself included, a first record, there's this desire to, um, I don't want to say get everything in there, but, you know, cover a lot of ground, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I was interested in doing that, and I felt that um, there's some things I still like on that. I mean, most musicians I know are crazy about their own recordings, and uh -huh. I'm certainly not, but um, uh, after the storm, I wanted it to be a more focused project, the same instrumentation throughout, and I, I guess I was interested in... After the Storm is a more mellow record, too, and um, just those particular compositions uh, I wanted to capture with Gerald and Massimo, some of the stuff we've been doing, and, um, yeah, without so many changes in instrumentation. Yeah. And, uh, and so you're uh, continuing to work with that, uh, that same trio of uh, Massimo, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Well, <laughs> Bill Cate Bill, Bill on the bass and uh, Joe so, Clayton on piano. You're continuing to work with that trio, correct? Yes, they're on the new recording as well. Okay. Um, uh, you were just kind of referring to that uh, more mellow sound on After the Storm, and their, uh, their references pop up all the time in, uh, in reviews of your music, uh, especially After the Storm, to 
uh, the ECM record label, and swinging yet modern. Uh, and uh, are you uh, trying to do a, a, a balance between some of that traditional swinging piano trio with uh, something that you might even call a more uh, modern, even European approach to the trio? You know, I don't really think about it like that. I just, mm -hmm. um, Peter Erskine, who's one of, I guess, my main teacher, said something to me like, just play and write the stuff that you want to hear, and um, which is really hard. You know, you, we're, we're always working towards that. And um, I just, I go for that, and I, I try not to think about, like, Oh, let's let's capture a swing thing here, and I mean, you want it to be balanced, and you want the set to flow, and for the art to be there. But I'm not thinking about like, oh, I want this to be like a Keith Jarrett type of tune, and then I want it to have this ECM vibe. I'm, I guess, those are definitely things that I've listened to, and um, you know, like any musician, they're going to come out and be playing, but hopefully, it's when it comes out, it's. Um, working towards an original voice. Mm -hmm. oh, well, and it, it seems like it's not just in the playing too, but uh, it's in the composition too, uh, that uh, I guess reflects your personality and your, uh, you know, what, what you are. Um, Andrea Cantor in Jazz Police um, talked about the original compositions being uh, up front and in the forefront of uh, After the Storm. And um, and she also goes on to say that your talents as a drummer are undeniable, but really what sets you apart is your talents as a composer and arranger. And uh, composition seems to be a really important thing, original composition for you. You're not doing uh, sets of standards, uh, you know. Um, you're, uh, you're doing your own music and you're doing original compositions. Uh, how did you uh, kind of take that, uh, that bent in, uh, in jazz and music? That's a good question. Um... I'm, I'd say the artists that I'm, a lot of the artists that I look up to, that has been their approach. And, you know, at some point in the not so distant future, like I will be doing some standards records and stuff like that. But, um, you know, when I think about Wayne Shorter and, um, you know, Dave Holland, Tom Harrell, Musicians like that, but I'm, you know, these guys like, I really look up to, and that that's a path that I really respect. And um, I don't know, for me, the I, I feel sometimes more free composing than you know drumming because it's something that I've studied less, and so there are sometimes I guess more possibilities because. I can't sit down at a piano like Josh Nelson's playing tonight and just, you know, have all these uh, different harmonic progressions come to mind. I really have to work through it slowly, and um, for me it's fun because it's, I don't want to say there's no rules or anything like that, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no rules playing either, but um, it's something I enjoy exploring, and it's something that uh, inspires me to kind of then practice it on the drums and try different approaches to the tunes. Too. Mm -hmm. I don't so, know if that answered your question. No, that does. That 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 does. And uh, and uh, I, I kind of understand that idea of uh, you have uh, less rules and frameworks that are you know kind of been beaten into you in studying, <laughs> and then uh, and that you might repeat as you as a composer. So you feel like you're a little bit more freer to kind of do uh, kind of what you feel. I guess. Yeah. I. You know, with drums, you know, I really spend a lot of time transcribing and, you know, just listening, and obviously we're listening to compositions and stuff too, but I haven't, you know, gone through and transcribed, you know, 50 Wayne Shorter trans mm -hmm. uh, compositions or anything like that. Right. You know, I just kind of listen to them and hopefully they come out organically. So you uh, mentioned you studied at the US USC Thornton School of Music, and I'm wondering how... Um, in that composition area, and I think you might have even just answered that, that um, composition wasn't really a main focus of study there for you. Uh, what were some of the things that you, uh, you got out of your, uh, your time at USC? Um, yeah, you're right. The composition was more secondary, I guess. It would, definitely we'd have classes in right. that, but it was, you know, it's a performance degree, and um, for 
for me, you know, I'm from Wisconsin and stuff, so when I first moved there, and I didn't know that much about jazz, I hadn't listened to that many records, so it was still building a foundation, um, you know, learning about great musicians, what to listen to, and then I spent um, three years studying with Peter Erskine, which was still building a foundation, but then also trying to find out how to use that in a way that's you, you know, working towards a personal voice, and um, also you're playing all the time. So that's where I met Gerald Clayton, and Massimo uh, was there too, and I would play every week with this great pianist, Alan Pasqua, and we just, you know, instead of just doing like a composition lesson or something, we just have, we just jam trio. So that, for me, was really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, just uh, another angle on this uh, original composition, because again, I also think that it's one of the things that will keep the music live and fresh, is having new music out there that uh, people can listen to and go, hey, maybe I'll do that tune, you know, instead of a, you know, a standard that's been done many other times. So I think that's a big part of, of what keeps jazz moving forward, is that original composition. But it must be a little bit hard to communicate um, one of the things that you said about After the Storm is we, you said, we try to get inside not just the melody, harmony, and rhythmic shape of a piece, but also the emotional feeling and message. So I wonder that with an original composition, um, is it uh, a little harder to communicate what that emotional feeling or message is that you're trying to get out of that piece with the musicians since they, it's not something they've heard over and over and over again or uh, that kind of thing? That's a good question, and it could change depending on the musicians and how they hear that tune, you know. Um, I like to talk about it as little as possible, and, you know, and hopefully it's something that we do play and explore, or not, you know, sometimes it's better to just go in and, and hit and see what happens, but um, I feel like it's implied in the writing, and sometimes I will, you know, just say small things about the tunes, just little vibe ideas, but I try to say as little as possible mm -hmm. and just let the musicians find their own way. Right. Well, um, After the Storm, um, as I was doing some reading, was supported uh, at least in part by a grant from the Puffin Foundation, and that's not, uh, the, that's not the, the first time that you've gotten either commissions or grants to write, and I would imagine that's a that's an offshoot of the fact that you do do a lot of composing, original composing. Um, uh, what do you have to do to secure grants like that? You know, they're pretty cool. Um, I, they actually, uh, I received another grant from them for this upcoming project, Black Elk Stream, and I just, that, that was pretty simple. I just put together a, a description of what I had in mind for the project, and they liked it, you know, they supported it, which I really appreciate. Um, one that, there was another one for After the Storm, um, this, what's it called? At the time it was the American Music Center, now it's New Music USA, so these programs are out there and it, you know, it really helps with um, putting together a project. And it sounded very familiar to me, I, and I hear a lot more about um, uh, funding, artist funding through crowdfunding types of things like Kickstarter or Indiegogo um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, on that route for uh, for musicians and if you've had any either experience with that or just any thoughts on that since that seems to be a, a new way of, uh, of doing this. Yeah, I if, if I can do grants and if, I don't know if you follow this person on Twitter, this anonymous person, Jazz is the Worst, mm -hmm. uh, they posted something which I don't, I won't say that I totally agree with or anything, but they said, and I may be misquoting this, that uh, Kickstarter is a public way where jazz musicians can ask their parents for money or something. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, which in some cases might be true, in some cases it might not, but I mean, the bottom line is, if that helps people get out quality art, in, then it's great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have reservations about, I think it would be hard to do it more than once, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, um, you know, if I can 
keep doing it without that, I would prefer to. Excellent. Well, um, uh, I wanted to uh, to ha uh, let you tell people where they can find out more information about you and kind of keep up to date with you, and especially as they uh, hear some of your new music and uh, as you got uh, your new disc coming out uh, in, uh, in the next uh, few months. Uh, where can folks find out more information about you? Um, there's a website, mattslocumjazz.com, uh, M-A-T-T-S-L-O-C-U-M, and... Uh, I'm actually trying to use Twitter now, so uh, I, I need to use it more frequently, but, um, I, and I will. So that's, that's at Matt Slocum Jazz. Excellent. Well, Matt, uh, it's great to have you back here at Jazz Live, and uh, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure, Vince. Thank you for having me.